I believe the truth of that song. If you have your Bible this evening, the book of Proverbs will be our text for the night. Proverbs chapter 27. I want to share a thought with you that, that is fresh to me. The Lord has just recently quickened it to me. In reading through Proverbs last week and finishing the book of Proverbs last week, I came on this verse of Scripture that I've read over every time I've read through the Scriptures, which is I don't know how many times now. I started when I was a teenage boy, and I'm 60 years old, so however many times I've read through the Bible, I've read over this verse, but it seemed as if it was brand new to me, as if I'd never seen it before. And the Lord began to speak to me out of it. So I want to share with you the fruit of what I saw and what is still uh, the Lord is using to examine my own heart. Proverbs 27 and verse 7, just one verse this evening. If you have your text found, stand in honor of the reading of God's inspired word. Proverbs 27, verse 7. The full soul loatheth an honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Father, I ask you now to help us or to think divine thoughts, to follow the, the logic, the reasoning of the Holy Ghost in the writing of this verse into the Bible. Help us to apply it to our own lives. And I pray this in Jesus' sake, for Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. The book of Proverbs is different from virtually every other biblical document in that context means almost nothing to much of this book. The first rule of rightly dividing the Word of God is you have to always consider context when you're studying any given text. You don't jerk a verse up out of the middle of Matthew chapter 10 and just take it as a standalone. You have to look at what goes before and what goes after, and that's the rule of thumb for studying the Word of God in general. But the book of Proverbs is different because from chapter 10 on, the body, the bulk of the book of Proverbs is written as a series of one or two sentence standalone statements, summations of truth. Context is not that significant in the book of Proverbs because each individual proverb is intended to be taken as a nugget of truth. And so I'm taking this one verse uh, because the context around it really doesn't, com uh, doesn't comment on it, and I'm isolating it as the Spirit of God, I believe, intended to think on it for a little while. A proverb is a general principle of truth. It's a short shrewd way of summing up a truism, a spiritual truth. Now you can pluck up a verse from virtually anywhere in Proverbs and find in that verse a principle that you can ponder and seek to apply to your life. So in reading through the book of Proverbs recently, this one verse grabbed my heart, began to provoke my thoughts in a very specific and convicting way. And I want to share with you what the Lord has shared with me. I titled my talk tonight, my message, so that's the problem. It helps me psychologically sometimes just to know what the problem is. I'm dealing with some physical issues. I won't go into the details. Doesn't matter. Been going on now for some time. I've been to several doctors, several specialists. A lot of tests have been run and a lot of speculation as to what it is, this, maybe that, something else, but no conclusive evidence. I find the most frustrating part of all that nobody can tell me what's the problem. Do you ever find yourself just wishing somebody could help you know what the problem is? Well, I found in this verse of Scripture a revelation of explanation that's, that tells me what the problem is in much of the modern religious world. Obviously, this verse of Scripture centers around the theme of appetite or lack thereof, lack of appetite, and so will my message tonight. I want to show you four things out of, the, uh, out of this verse that are, that are triggered by this verse on the matter of appetite and how critical the level of our hunger for God is in terms of determining the level of our interest and our investment in His eternal kingdom. Let me give you four statements that I believe I can substantiate from this verse. First of all, I find here this principle. Appetite determines appeal. Appetite determines appeal. The full soul loatheth an honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Now the wording of this verse is very physical, and it can be understood on a literal level. 
you eat to capacity, you get up from a table and you have stuffed yourself and you say, I couldn't hold another bite. Well, that's the physical aspect of this verse. You've all been there, I'm sure. I have as well. I came out of a Bible conference these last three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday over in Gina, Louisiana. They fed us like kings. I'm telling you, I knew what it was to get up from the table and say, I couldn't hold another bite. And you've been in situations like that, no doubt. But I don't believe the Holy Spirit intends us to confine our understanding of this verse of Scripture only to the literal or the physical level. I believe there is a spiritual application of this, and I want to make that application tonight. It reminds me, the spiritual side of this principle reminds me of something that Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 34 when he was at the well meeting the woman. You remember the famous woman at the well passage. His disciples had gone into town to find food, and Jesus knew that his father had a divine an appointment for him with a woman at that well and she came and they conversed and she went away with her life changed and her, his disciples came back and tried to press him to eat the food that they had purchased and brought back from the village and Jesus said I have meat to eat that ye know not of and it puzzled them they said who snuck up and gave him a, a, a snack lunch while we were gone where did he get something to eat and then he said this my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He was using the concept of food and feeding. Though it's a very physical image, he was using it to speak of spiritual reality. And perhaps you recall in John chapter 6 when Jesus made that startling statement to the great crowds that were following him, if you won't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. Well, they were offended. They didn't understand. They went away. Many of them, the Bible says, went away and followed him no more. But Jesus said to his disciples, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I have sensed the Holy Spirit pressing me to see this proverbial principle as a great deal more than a culinary concept, but as a large truth that has serious spiritual ramifications. The idea of Full and hungry are commonly used. These two terms are commonly used in the Word of God in a spiritual sense in relation to spiritual things. Full, the word by definition means to be stuffed to capacity. Satiated is the word you'll find if you do some research on it. It keeps coming up in the, from the linguistic scholars. Satiated, full, stuffed to capacity. The word hungry means to be empty, to be famished, to not only need nourishment, to be longing for nourishment. A sense of desperate desire. Psalm 42, this very image, this very physical image is used to speak of a spirit hungering for God. The Bible says, as the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. And in Psalm 63, the Bible speaks of the soul thirsting and the flesh longing to see the power and the glory of God. Psalm 107 verse 9, He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. How critically important, my, my friend, is the level of our appetite for God. It literally determines everything else about us. When I am full, in the sense of this verse, when I am stuffed, when I am glutted on other things, then even the richest Bible teaching and the sweetest ministrations of the Holy Spirit and fellowships of the church have no appeal to me. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb. The word translated loatheth in this text is a very physical picture. Again, the word image is to walk on something, to tread on it. The full soul tramples underfoot a honeycomb. That would be a very literal way to tramp. The full soul, the stuffed soul, the glutted soul walks on a honeycomb, tramples underfoot a honeycomb. It means to care so little about it that you just walk right over it and keep on going, paying it no mind whatsoever. Now that picture of walking on, trampling underfoot, brings to mind a New Testament text to me. Probably some of you know your Bible well enough. It may have a familiar ring. Hebrews chapter 10 says, If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. 
but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. And then it goes on to define what that willful sin means. It's, it, the, the Word of God says to get to that condition where I'm willfully sinning against God, what that is is the equivalent of trotting underfoot the Son of God and treating the blood of the covenant wherewith I was sanctified as an unholy thing and doing despite under the Spirit of grace. What a graphic description of an absolute lack of interest, finding nothing appealing in that honeycomb, and so consequently I just walk over it as if it is utterly meaningless to me. When I'm hungry, when I'm famished, when I'm desperate and full of desire for the Lord and for spiritual things, then I'll tell you, even every bitter thing is sweet to me. I got to meditating on that concept of bitter thing. I'll put it like this. When, I'm, when I have a real hunger for the things of God, even poor singing and poor preaching interests me. <laughs> right. I mean, even, even, even poor church interests me. I don't have to have a professionally trained choir. I don't have to have a polished orchestra. Brother, you can have old Sadie, ain't Sadie get up and bang out a tune on an out of, bang out a song on an out of tune upright piano and we'll sing there's power in the blood and my soul gets stirred up because I'm hungry for God. It doesn't have to be just right by the world standard. It doesn't have to be a professional performance. All I have to do is find some little watering hole somewhere where I can hear something about Jesus. Amen. And, of course, I think of the bitter thing, not only in that regard, but I, I thought when I get hungry for God, when my heart's full of hunger for the Lord, then even hard to hear words of rebuke that men would say were bitter words. I mean, they cut and they convict and, and they make me bleed and I leave limping when I hear that message. It, 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 it calls me to account and it, as we say, walks on my toes. Like one fellow said to a friend of mine one night, I, Preacher, you stepped on my toes. He said, My aim was off. I was shooting for your heart. I didn't mean to hit your toes. What your toes got to do with it? But you know what I'm talking about, brother. When that hard word comes and God's ringing your bell and, and it's you the Holy Ghost is fingering and saying, you're the one who needs to be on an even bitter things are sweet. Brother, I even welcome that when I'm hungry for God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 says that no chast chastisement for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. There are times God has to deal with us in a way that in the short term seems grievous. But when I'm hungry for him, brother, every bitter thing is sweet. Yeah, it all comes down to appetite. A person who is full tramples on a honeycomb. But to a hungry person, any bitter thing is sweet. It all comes down to appetite. Whether or not I find the delicacies of the Lord to be appealing or not is determined by whether I am personally full or hungry. So first of all, appetite determines appeal. Secondly, and this is the same principle on the other side, appetite determines apathy. Appetite determines apathy. If I do not find the sweet bread of heaven and the sweet water of life appealing, then by default that means I am an apathetic Christian. I am apathetic toward the things of God. Now, folk, apathy is a terrible spiritual pandemic that's sweeping away much of the modern religious world. The word apathy means by definition lack of passion, absence of interest regarding the things of Christ. Looking upon the things of God as unworthy of serious concern or devoted attention or concentrated effort. Lack of passion, lack of interest. This verse of Scripture speaks of it. Let me read it to you from another translation. The full man has no use for honey. But to the man in need of food, every bitter thing is sweet. That which renders a person apathetic, that, that which renders any person apathetic toward the Lord and the precious truths of His Word is that we are glutted and stuffed full of other things. Idolatrous substitutes have so crammed our lives full that we are satisfied with our spiritual status quo and consequently apathetic toward the offer of the Lord for Him to fill us with His Spirit, bring us into the reality of revival. When you begin to think in terms of full in the biblical sense, when, when the full soul stands for one who is stuffed with stuff, 
so distracted by so many things that they are satisfied with their spiritual status quo. When you begin to think of full in terms of being fed up on the world's junk food to the point that the honey out of the rock has no interest for you. And pressing on into that place that the Lord said flows with milk and honey, it holds so little interest to you that you regard it as just not worth the effort. Then you're beginning to understand the spiritual application of this text. I remember this passage from 1 John as I preached through the book of 1 John a year or so ago. 1 John chapter 2 says to the people of God, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And here's the deal. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When I get filled up with the love of the world, then it makes me apathetic toward the love of the Father. It makes me unconcerned, disconnected from the things of God. And this was fleshed out in a man in the New Testament whose name is Demas. He was a ministry partner of the Apostle Paul. He walked side by side with the greatest soul winner, missionary evangelist to ever live, I would suppose, one of certainly the greatest to ever live, Paul the Apostle. He was his partner in ministry, heard that man of God preach and teach, and yet at the end of the way, here's what Paul had to say of him, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He got himself so distracted and so glutted. It doesn't say he loved this evil world. It's not that he went off into gross sin. It's just that he got himself so full of the temporal things of this world that he has lost interest in the things of God, the things of ministry. And the last we see of him is his coattail. As he's walking out of sight and Paul says, Jesus hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. With the things of this temporal world, sports, media, social media, entertainments, hobbies, career, whatever, with the things of this temporal world taking up so much space in my heart and life, how could you expect me then to pant hard after God? How could you expect me to be someone who's willing to open my mouth wide so that He can fill me? Psalm 19 verse 10 says of the Word of God and the things of God, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. That's the right-minded Christian's attitude toward the things of God. Oh, I can't get enough. Oh, Lord, fill me. I'm so hungry. It's sweeter to me than honey from the honeycomb. Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I tell you, beloved, tonight, appetite is the determining factor in the presence or the absence of apathy. Where you find appetite for God, apathy can't survive. It's going to die of natural causes. And when you find apathy in place in a person's life, the root cause is they don't have any hunger for God. They're so full of other things that the things of the Lord hold no appeal. Appetite determines appeal. Appetite determines apathy. Let me say thirdly, appetite determines appreciation. Appetite determines appreciation. Obviously, along with the concept of full and hungry, the big picture of this verse is about an attitude of appreciation. Here is the picture of someone who is so stuffed with other stuff that literally a honeycomb could drop off of a tree limb into their path and they don't care enough even to bend over and taste it, they just walk right over it with no appreciation for it whatsoever. But the hungry person, so desperate, so full of a desire, so aching with the desire for more of God, the hungry soul is grateful and appreciative even of that which other people might dismiss as no big deal and not so hot and not very tasty at all. The level of my spiritual appetite will determine the degree of my appreciation for the opportunities that the Lord places in my life and at my disposal. I could ask the question of myself, of you, do you view the Word of God and the worship of God as something precious, something to be prized, or as something dull and dead and disinteresting? If pastors and our Sunday school teachers are worth their salt, they labor all week to prepare rich, nourishing dishes from the cupboard of the book of God to serve up to their congregations or their classes. But of what concern is that to a person whose soul is so surfeited 
with the world's junk food, the idolatrous substitutes of the devil, that they have no appetite left over for the eternal things of God. Where you have no appetite, you also have no appreciation. You have no, no gratitude. For the hard work that your Sunday school teacher put into that lesson to get ready to feed you the Word of God. Luke 21, 34, Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. Surfeiting is a King James word. It just means, it just means stuffing yourself to the point of ridiculousness. Be careful that you don't be overcharged. Your heart is not overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Imagine yourself a cook who gives everything you have to find and fix recipes that you think your family will enjoy, that will be a blessing to them, that will nourish them and help them be strong and healthy, and you labor over a hot stove and you prepare that meal only to have one after another of them say as they come through the door, oh, I, I, I ate a hot dog with my friends down on the corner. I, I'm, I'm full already. I'm not hungry. And walk past it. Luke chapter 14, Jesus said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Well, there are banquets been prepared. And of course, the one in the story is the Lord himself. He's the, the object of the story. A banquet's been prepared. A meal has been spread. You talk about an opportunity given to draw up to the table and feast on the things of eternity. All things are now ready. And the Bible says they all with one consent began to make excuse and the most ridiculous excuses. I bought a piece of land and now I've got to go look at it. I don't know anybody goofy enough to buy real estate before they've looked at it. But that was one guy's excuse. And the second guy said, I bought a team of oxen and now I have to go test drive them. And once again, if that guy's on the market for a car, I'll sell him a car if he'll buy it first and test drive it later, right? Nobody does that. It's absolutely ludicrous. The last guy might have had an argument. He said, I've married a wife and I can't come. He might have had a leg to stand on, but he's the only one, right? I mean, the opportunity's given. What a golden privilege. The table's spread. The meal's ready. Come. All things are ready. Nine, half. Got, got other things I've got going on. Lack of appreciation. And it's what the Lord said. The Lord said unto that servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. My friend, lack of appreciation for the offers of the Lord, the sweet things of God. Lack of appreciation is a serious matter. And I'll tell you, it's one that's going to determine much of what we experience when at last we see Him face to face in glory. Appetite determines appreciation. And lastly, appetite determines appropriation. Appetite determines appropriation. Obviously, this story, this passage, this verse of Scripture is about someone laying hold of and laying claim to what is offered to them. The full soul just walks on the honeycomb, makes no effort to take it in hand and, and carry it to his mouth and taste it and feed on it. No interest in it whatsoever, just walks over and walks away. The hungry soul, on the other hand, is so famished and so desperate and so full of desire that everything offered to him is seized with gratitude and ingested into his life and made the most of for the glory of God. Psalm 81:10, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. Psalm 119, verse 131, I opened my mouth and I panted, for I longed for thy commandments. The desire to take hold of truth, to chew on and swallow down the honey of heaven is all about being eager to take personal possession of what God offers me in Christ. The intensely practical wording of this text touches upon an intensely spiritual issue. Here is pictured a man so overfed and full that even if a honeycomb were to drop right into his path, he couldn't be bothered to stoop and stop and pick it up. He would trample it underfoot and walk on, unwilling even to pause and bend over 
to dip his finger in the succulent sweetness that God has providentially brought in his path. When he looks on that honeycomb, he sees it, nothing desirable at all, and thus nothing to make any effort to lay claim to or to personally consume. Not only is this the attitude that says, now preacher, look, I've just got too many irons in the fire. I I can't be expected to actually practically follow hard after the Lord. I've just got too much going on in my life. There's that on the one hand, but this is even worse than that. This is someone before whom the Lord is actually dropping his honey right into your path. And you're so indifferent to him because you're so glutted on the world that you tread down his divinely given opportunities. But here's another man who's so hungry that when any little thing is offered to him, he seizes it and he savors it as if it's the most wonderful thing in the world. It reminds me of a couple of passages in the New Testament where the idea of crumbs comes in. In Luke chapter 16, the man, the rich man and Lazarus, remember the rich man, the Bible says, fared sumptuously every day. He had, oh my goodness, such a, such a, a feast spread before him every day. And Lazarus, the beggar, laid at the rich man's doors and the Bible says he would fain have filled his body. He would love to have had just the crumbs that fell off the rich man's table. Matthew 15, the Lord Jesus had an encounter with a woman who asked him to do something for her and he said it is not suitable for the children's bread to be given to dogs and she said that's true Lord but even dogs are allowed to eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Well, the idea of crumbs, what what that means, here's somebody so desperate for God, so hungry, so so desirous for the Lord to do something in her life that that, that even crumbs look to her like a feast that she'd be glad to get hold of. My friend, one one of my heroes in the Lord and a man that meant much to me, he's home with Jesus now, Brother Ron Dunn was asked one night in my hearing, someone asked him to explain if he had an explanation for the incredible phenomenal growth of the charismatic movement, which in that, at that time, this is back in the 1990s, at that time it was really running at high tide. In the 1980s and 1990s, the charismatic movement was sweeping the country. And somebody said, Brother Ron, how do you explain? There are so many doctrinal errors and, and so much excess, and, and yet the, the movement just grows. How, how do you explain the growth of the charismatic movement? And Brother Ron made this one statement. He said, if a man gets hungry enough, he'll even eat out of a garbage can. And his point being, when people get desperate, it was really a rebuke to the, to, the, to the evangelical church because what he was saying is we've so grieved the Holy Ghost away from fundamentalism that though our doctrine may be straight, the power of God can't be found and people are starving to death to find the power of God. And when they get desperate enough, they'll go anywhere, anywhere to encounter the Lord. So here's this man hungry, so hungry that every bitter thing is sweet. This is the clamorous desire for more and more of the Lord that says, I just can't get enough. Lord, I'm starving for you. Oh God, oh God, I'm so hungry. And every opportunity to that soul is seen as precious and delicious and seized and feasted upon with gratitude. It is the level of my appetite that determines my willingness to take hold of the things of God, to bring into my own possession the things that the Lord is offering me, to claim them for my own, to take them in my own hand and bring them to my own mouth, not to be satisfied just to hear a preacher preach and talk about the honeycomb. I want to dip my hand in the honeycomb and get that honey on my tongue appropriation, my appropriation of God's great and precious promises. That is, my eagerness to possess my possessions in Christ all comes down to the issue of whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry. And so let me just be specific. My interest in church, my interest in church and my receptivity of the Word is explained on the level of whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry. Church attendance seen as so non-essential and so unimportant by so many believers. Why why is it, you think, that church attendance is seen as so non-essential and so unimportant by so many believers? Well, the full soul loathes the honeycomb. And even when in attendance, why are the precious truths of the Word of God received with such disinterested casualness and coldness in much of church life today? Why? The full soul loatheth an honeycomb. 
Where's the zeal? Where's the fervor? Where's the passion? Where's the delighted worship that ought to mark out the true people of God? The, soul, the full soul loatheth and honeycomb. You see, where there is no appetite, neither will there be any delight or any determination to appropriate, to make the most of, to lay hold of and lay claim to what is available to me from the good hand of my God. The precious things offered by Christ to His children will just be walked on and treated as if they matter not at all. I'll tell you this tonight as I close. I'd rather have a person be hungry for God than to be anything else. I'd rather have a person have a hunger for God than to be brilliant. I'd rather have a person be full of appetite for the Lord than to be gifted or to be skilled or to be wealthy or anything else I can think of because a ravenous appetite for God and for the things of eternity will overcome every other defect. And it will render you someone that God can use mightily because it will, be, it will make you someone He can fill thoroughly. The level of my filling with the Lord is determined by the level of my feeding on the Lord, which is in turn dependent on the level of my hunger and thirst for Him. So, dear friend, I say to you tonight this. Our God has some honey out of the honeycomb for us. In fact, what He has for us is sweeter than honey. It's more precious than silver. It's more costly than gold. The question is, do you want it? Do you crave it? Do you appreciate it? And are you determined to appropriate it? Recently I was preaching in a meeting, and Brother Jeremy, we were preaching together up the country in a, in a week-long meeting. I preached the first couple of nights, and Brother Jeremy preached the last three nights outside of Henderson, Texas. And as that, that meeting went on every service, they dismissed the service after the invitation was over. They dismissed the service by singing one verse a night from this great hymn. I hadn't heard the song in years and years. I don't think we have it in our book. In fact, I, I checked to see. I don't believe we have it. Set my soul afire, Lord. They sang one verse of it every night as the dismissal from the service. And this is a couple of those verses. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me. Let thy voice be heard. Millions grope in darkness in this day and hour. I will be your witness Fill me with thy power. And then another verse said, Set my soul afire, Lord, in my daily life. Far too long I've wandered in this day of strife. Nothing else will matter but to live for thee. I will be your witness as you live in me. That is the appetite, I believe, of every genuine God-centered person in this room tonight. Lord, I hunger for that. I long for that. I'm not so, listen, God help us if we're so glutted and stuffed of junk that that kind of heart, that kind of desire is a total foreign thing to us. That you would walk on the honeycomb of heaven rather than grasp it with both hands and bring it to your mouth and let it fill you with the sweetness of eternity. Would you stand with me tonight as we pray? Father, I want to thank you for this verse of Scripture and how it's predicated so many things in my life, triggered thoughts, pushed me down alleyways, caused me to examine my own heart, Lord, to question myself, am I a man full, full of stuff, full of activity, full of responsibility, full of busyness, to the point that I can't even be bothered to bend over and scoop up the honey that God's dropping in my path, or am I someone full of hunger, yearning, aching, longing. And so every little thing that comes my way, I'm so grateful for it and I feast on it as a gift from God. Father, I pray tonight there be someone in the service who needs to get on an altar and just say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've so overfed myself on junk food that I've lost my appetite for the beefsteak and the honeycomb of heaven. Father, if that be true, help us get right with you tonight. Lord, use this little verse, this one little verse in the Bible. As a, as a source of self-examination for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Spirit of God speaks to your heart tonight. You'll be obedient.